to Halting Towards Zion, the podcast where we limp like Jacob to the promised land and talk about life, the universe, and everything along the way. I'm Emily Maxson, here with Greg Uttinger and Brian Brew, and we are in the middle of a series on the Ten Commandments and how they shape a culture, what a society looks like where the Ten Commandments are held in esteem. We have come to the Fourth Commandment in the Reformed Reckoning as opposed to the Catholic or Lutheran reckoning, uh, which is the commandment regarding the Sabbath. Exodus chapter 20, verse 8 through 11 says, Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work, thou nor thy son nor thy daughter, thy manservant nor thy maidservant, nor thy cattle, nor thy stranger that is within thy gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that in them is, and rested the seventh day. Wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. So on what is this commandment based? (laughs) Well, it says that it's based upon the doctrine of six-day creation. Hmm. Oh, wait, that would mean we would have to actually believe in six-day creation to take the commandment seriously. Oh, rats, not many people do that anymore. Well, isn't Uh, it like a metaphor for how (laughs) powerful God is? Yeah, God showed us in Genesis 1 in six tableau paintings, the greatness of his power, though apparently none of those things actually ever happened, and God never said any of that. Okay, enough of the sarcasm. (laughs) Let me tell you a little little snippet out of my my history as a teenager. some friends of ours would come over and they would play tapes by R. J. Rush Dooney, and one of them was titled The Sociology of the Sabbath. And I thought the title was probably 16, 17 year old. I thought the title was really cool, although I really didn't have a good idea of what sociology was. And there were <laughs> Does a couple, anyone really? <laughs> there were a couple points he made that stayed with me. I thought, this is great. I, I wish I could hear that again. And eventually it was printed in one of his books, and I read it and was rather disappointed. Because it didn't really seem to explain the sociology of the Sabbath. It seemed kind of rambling, actually. And so I put it aside, somewhat disappointed. And a few years later, I went back and read it again, thinking, no, I just had to not be paying attention. I wasn't, my mind wasn't ready to receive. I go back, I'll, I'll, I'll see that there are wonderful things there. And I did it again, and it was even worse than that. Oh, no. <laughs> like, this, I don't know why he picked this title. I think he picked it. The reason for the same reason I liked it. It was a cool title. It's a cool <laughs> title. <laughs> but it, it, what he wrote really didn't live up to it. And so when I was writing the uh, the articles, which are sort of the basis for what we're working our way through, I came to this and said, I'm going to use that title. Only I'm actually going to talk about the sociology of the Sabbath <laughs> a little bit, uh, which is to say, what are the social implications, the cultural implications of in Israel's day at least, setting aside the seventh day of the week as a Sabbath of rest, as a seal on the covenant, and as a time to worship God and hear his word. How? My point here is not to argue, as we often do, well, what does that mean you can and can't do? I don't care. (laughs) Um, We don't need a list of rules. (laughs) We don't need a list of rules. At this point, what we need to do is just sort of step back and see the big picture. What what multiple thing, multiple thing, many things was God doing in giving Israel the Sabbath? And, and how was that to affect their culture, their society, their civilization? Had they actually obeyed it faithfully? We, they didn't. So we can't really look at them in any great detail and say, oh, look what happened because they kept the Sabbath. But we can at least look at the commandment itself and God's justification from it for it, and some of the, the things that underlie it, like the idea of a six-day creation, and say, well, this is what's wrapped up in it. So had they kept it, here are some things that very likely would have, could have, should have happened. And since you ask, I think the first thing that we have to do is start where the law starts. In six days, the Lord made heaven and earth. Every time God's people stopped on the Sabbath day and rested from their labor, they were imitating what Genesis said God did. And they were interpreting Genesis in what some people would call a very wooden literal way. That is, they actually believed that God operated uh, in the creation week in 24-hour periods 
that could be measured on a clock and charted on a calendar, and that this was not back, back in some mythic time, Bible stories, Bible times, Bible peoples, Bible <laughs> lands, but was actually a historical event that, in fact, inaugurated history. And, and in doing so, God set a pattern for how man was to act. Now, when we look at Genesis 2, there's no exact command to keep the Sabbath, but then there didn't have to be in the age of man's innocency. He knew he was the image of God. He delighted to be like God and imitate his Father in heaven. And we're told that God rested and that God sanctified the Sabbath and blessed it. It would be obvious to man that, oh, well, I need to be like God in this. I'll be working and I'll be resting. And, and this God has set a pattern for me. And here Moses is confirming it. Yeah, God set a pattern. But, but notice at this idea of six days of work and one of rest and worship is the idea that God in our history shaped our world, starting with the very creation of time itself. This over against some kind of pantheism, some kind of ongoing evolution where the universe evolves within itself and out of itself forever and ever, as opposed to some view of circular time where things just keep going around and around and around, or static time where time just is or isn't. The, the Bible here commits us to a particular view of time, one that can be reckoned on clocks and calendars, one that God gave us. And therefore, we do insist that God can tell time and God can count things. And philosophically, that's huge. So that for starters. Yeah, we actually have just passed at the time of recording, recording uh, Rosh Hashanah. Mm. And I just learned, I didn't know this, but there's a number for each year. Like it was the year 5,780, mm -hmm. I think it was. I didn't know that, that we were still counting <laughs> from before, you know, that was, that was news to me, but it was like, wow, I guess, yeah, it makes sense that we would do that. <laughs> well, the Jewish people don't accept Messiah as the climax of old covenant history. So why would they stop counting? And yes, they've always counted. They are counting forward from zero up to whenever Messiah blessed he be, he should come. Christians differ in that we believe that Jesus has come. And so we reckon him as the center point of history. And we reckon things before his coming as BC, before Christ, and in the year of his reign, in the year of the Lord and Autonomy, uh, and we count forward. But like Orthodox Jews, we are committed to counting history. It's not, these are not arbitrary numbers. We believe these are real numbers and they don't go back, they don't recede into infinity. Mm -hmm. There's a time when we start, there is a zero and it's not that far back. The Jewish number you said is 5,000, do you remember exactly? I believe it was 5,780. Yeah, and I would disagree with them slightly, but they're very certainly in the ballpark. Mm -hmm. uh, somewhere around 6,000 years is pretty pretty close. And as men came to, to celebrate with God, to rejoice in his goodness, to hear his word, to break off their, their weekly work of dominion for a day, they would be asserting that they're doing this because of a literal six-day creation sometime within the past few thousand years of Earth's history. Now, the next thing that implies uh, or, or what's wrapped up, obviously, in that is that God's the creator. It wasn't just a creation of some sort. It was the personal God, Yahweh Elohim, who spoke the world into existence out of nothing. So by celebrating the Sabbath day, they were not simply remembering a random first week, but a sovereignly created, sovereignly ordained first week. Uh, that came out of the mind and heart of a God who's got a plan, an eternal plan, and an, a plan that reaches forward into eternity, uh, and a God who ought to be obeyed, who ought to be worshipped, and who ought to be imitated. So, you know, if you, if, if you live your life this way, there are some problems with embracing secular evolution or pantheistic evolution at the same time. There's a, there's a certain non-residence, whatever that word would be good. When things don't resonate together, there's a dissonance. There you go. There's a, there's a philosophical and religious dissonance 
to say that you believe in evolution out of billions of years, and yet you're patterning your life on a 6-1 principle, which would be to say on a fairy tale. That doesn't work very well. France tried it, right? Oh, yeah, they, no. they tried to fix it in the French Revolution. They decided a 10-day week made a lot more sense. Um, I don't know if they had any days of rest included in there, but they, they did, tried they, to restructure the week for sure. Yeah, as I recall, they didn't have a regular uh, day off. They had um, various workers' holidays, mm. and they named all of their days after working implements and working processes, and you know, like hammer day and shovel day and things like that, because that <laughs> would really get the common man excited about oh, man. living out his life. I'm so uh, excited for shovel day. <laughs> <laughs> and the Russian communists tried something like that and it too did not work very well. I, I've actually had my students ask, so where did this 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 seven day week come from? Like, the Bible. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know it's in the Bible. Where did why do we have it? Because of the Bible. No, no, yes. yes. It's in the Bible, but where did it no, you're not listening to me. <laughs> God started it. God's people preserved it. The church picked it up. The church carried it to the world and anywhere it was still wasn't a cultural memory from the original creation. The force of the habit coinciding with man's own nature and God's working in the human body made it a wonderfully acceptable thing, <laughs> general yeah. revelation and man's being and all that. There so, was evening and yeah. there was morning. The first day actually was the first Sunday and like started yeah. the whole cycle. Yeah. 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 Kind of blows. I, I understand why it's difficult to grasp. Like it is kind of astonishing. To think about. Well, the uh, the other things, the day, the year, the month, are tied to stellar things that we can observe. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But there is no such thing for the week. The week is a divine creation and appointment. And it's, it, it makes sense. I mean, it's, it's understandable why students say, well, we get where a day comes from and a year comes from, but a week? What's that all mm -hmm. about? Well, read Genesis, please, <laughs> and don't push it into Bible dates, Bible times, Bible lands, Bible right. mythology. Uh, in, I, I'd like to um, address something I've assumed, but I, I think it would be good retroactive to go back and, and, and imagine that I said this earlier. Uh, when we start talking about, about liturgy and in, in all the wideness that that can mean, mm -hmm. uh, not necessarily just the liturgy of church, but the liturgy of life, Christmas and Thanksgiving and all kinds of things. Are you These, talking about the the rhythms that we observe throughout the life? rhythms? The rhythms we observe religiously, not not in the sense that, not in the, in the metaphorical religious sense, but actually religion. We do that for the glory of God, or we do it to worship God, or to celebrate God, or to be thankful for God, mm -hmm. whether it's formal within church or in the broader scope of life. I mean, getting up and doing our devotions in the morning, as as opposed to turning on pop radio in the morning, which is also another kind of liturgy, but not what I have in mind. <laughs> the, the liturgies we observe, and particularly those where God has positively ordained them, first of all, they are things that are pleasing to God because of the way they reflect who God is. God is echoing back himself through us and to, to us through us, back to himself. And he delights in himself. So when we, we echo, when we reflect, when we image him, he, he delights in that. But there is also what we might call and we'll be careful here, a pragmatic function of liturgy. That is, it's it's a tool that God uses in us. Mm -hmm. When we read his word, when we pray, yes, it's for the glory of God, but it also does something in us. Mm -hmm. And sometimes we're, we're, we're so holy. No, worship is just about glorifying God. I get nothing out of it. Well, you're lame then. <laughs> um, <laughs> It is true that the, the, that our priority is God's glory, but part of what of God's glory is sharing Himself to to and with us. And so, when He speaks to us, and when He calls us to respond with prayer, with Bible reading, with confession, to to submit to the preaching of His Word, to come to the supper, to receive holy baptism, He is also instructing us and conditioning us. And yes, that's a valid word as long as we're careful on the kind of the kind of creatures the kind, kind of servants, the kind of sons we ought to be. In, in a good family, godly family, there are little liturgies of life. And now I'm using it kind of in the broader sense, but not exclusively. I'm guessing 
that. And, and as far as I know, your families, your families were in many ways more consistently Christian, more self-consciously Christian than my own was. And I assumed that there were things like daily devotions. My my mom always took me to church. Dad eventually got into that habit much later. But see, there's the word habit. There are things that we do habitually because we know that these patterns of behavior help to produce a kind of environment that's conducive to godliness, to learning, to joy, to love, to helping one another. And some of them are not universal. You don't have to have your devotions first thing in the morning. Some people have them in the evening or before bedtime or, you know, there's all kinds of things you can do there. But these kind of patterns we we know can be good for us as long as we don't idolize them and don't take the heart out of them. They they can be stepping stones to to growth, you know, teaching your kids to uh, clear the table and to do the dishes. When they, there can be their wonderful lessons in self-discipline and self-government. Now, the lesson doesn't come automatically, but it's a place for practicing the grace that God gives you. And so, by the same token here, as God is giving Israel the Sabbath and many other outward forms of worship, of which the Sabbath is very central, he is deliberately trying to shape their culture, their thinking, the way they go about things. So what we're trying to do here is not read into something or force something on the text. This is the very nature of what mm-hmm. liturgy is like, of what worship is like. Yeah. When, when you kneel before God on a regular basis, that communicates something to you. Mm-hmm. And when you stand up to hear his word, that communicates. And when you sing out loud rather than mumbling, that communicates something. It changes your own perspective on who God is and your own relationship to him. So that's maybe should have gone up front. But so far we've talked about, well, we've talked about belief in a literal six to create creation. We've talked about the sovereignty of God in making the world. And that leads immediately to the sovereignty of God over time. The Sabbath day was not a token day for God. Well, God gets one day and we get the other six, let alone it was not a, uh, or was it a, um, a token morning for God or a token hour. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we say the Lord's Day, but we mean we, he gets an hour. If he's lucky, we get the rest of the day. But what they, what Israel was doing here was testifying that if by giving God this day, we're testifying that all days are his, mm-hmm. all months, all weeks, all years, all centuries are his. Our whole life is his. He owns our time. And he demands as a special return to him this one day in seven, just as with our money, he demands one-tenth of it. Not so that then we're free to do with the rest however we want, but to recognize that all of our money is his, is all of our time is his, all of our life, all of our work, all of our efforts, all of our exertions. The Sabbath day becomes God's total claim on our lives in all of their productivity, in all of our working and resting and playing. And so again, we're, we're, we're right at the beginning of things. And the danger of turning the Lord's Day or the Sabbath day into, but what can you do and what can't you do, kind of misses the point, or at least it easily can. That's why I really don't want to go there today. Now, moving on to something that, in my notes at least, is a separate thing, but it, this is all flows together. I've kind of, I've I hinted at it, or I've said it, and that's the concept of linear time. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. You're moving forward. Monday is not Tuesday. Tuesday is not Thursday. Uh, we are not circling back on ourselves. We're not stuck and in an eternal Groundhog's Day like Bill Murray <laughs> or what was that? Okay, never mind. There's a sci-fi <laughs> television series that I cannot come up with right now based on the idea that the Egyptian gods were actually aliens. Oh, Stargate. Stargate. Yeah, there's one episode <laughs> where uh, the the characters in Stargate get stuck in that same kind oh, of, yeah, of yeah, loop yeah. over and over it's again. It's got the, the Fruit Loops clip is from that yes. episode. Yeah. yeah, and it's it's the, they get to the point where they they stop even trying to get out of it. They just realize it's going to repeat. Let's just play golf today. <laughs> yeah, in the middle of my backswing. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, but Christianity is exempt from that. We are moving forward, whether we like it or not. We sometimes we do want to call back yesterday and just. Stay here. This is the great time. I love these. Are my happy days? I want you to stay here forever. God says, "Uh, uh-uh, ain't happening." Sunday, Time's- Monday, happy days. Yeah. <laughs> and going back to the the Stargate example, it's a a fairly handy example of why cyclical time isn't good for people because you will go mad. Yeah. 
Yes. <laughs> you can't make any progress. You can't yeah. do anything meaningful. You can't build on what you did the day before. Exactly. And that's what we're talking about. The idea of a, of the Sabbath day of counting upward discreetly to seven means that progress is a possibility within this system. We are not in the closed loop where we always do it this way because our ancestors have always done it that way. And if we do it a different way, the demons will get us. We actually believe in the possibility of progress. And it's rooted, first of all, in, in spiritual progress. I go every Sabbath to hear the Word of God taught to me. And I go in the context of other people, especially my family. And we together learn the Word of God. And, and, and we, by faith, believe that some of it's going to stick. I, I'm going to, after a finite time, I'm going to know more about the Bible and what God demands of me and what God promises me than I did months or years ago. And Lord willing, I will be changed. I will, in my own walk with God, make progress. And the results of that will work themselves out in all kinds of things, like maybe I'm learning to work harder, save better, be a better husband, kinder father. And that's going to have cultural ramifications. Progress is a possibility, not just spiritual progress, but technological progress, pragmatic progress on all, on all sorts of levels. Uh, and as um, God's people look forward to a Sabbath, Sabbath was, well, as one of our hymns says, day of all the days, the best, emblem of eternal rest. They could, one, look forward on, in the short term to things getting better, but they could also see that in the long term, things could get better. God worked six days and rested and were his image. God stopped creating. His work had a definitive end. And as they, they could look and see, not only does from week to week, my work has an end. But over the course of my life and over the course of human life, there could be an end. There could be a time when we, the kingdom of God is realized amongst us. A time when we have subdued the earth. A time when we, we have filled the planet, as God said. And we're ready to present the, the, the thing back to God and say, we've done what you said, Father. Here it is. Now, of course, sin is a problem. And so now we are we're faced with the reality of our spiritual struggles, of temptation and of all that. We have to look not only at our individual sanctification and our willingness to evangelize and to fulfill the Great Commission, but then everything that's going to flow out of that. And it's a far more complicated thing, this coming of the New Jerusalem. Well, this this looking ahead to the rest and the end of labor requires you to plan for labor, doesn't it? If you're looking forward all week to a day when you're not going to go out and gather any food, you're not going to go out and try and make your life better, means you should have maybe thought about it the day before and made sure <laughs> yeah. you can you know, have something to eat. In other words, planning, yeah. mm -hmm. being a provident people, that actually is a line from Rush to me. <laughs> yeah, it, it, we we look into the future not simply as something that magically is going to come and, and ding us with with magical jitters of happiness, but it's something that has to be thought out and planned for and carefully because um, the world is complicated. God made a very complicated world. Here you can insert everything we know about the science of ecology. If you don't do things right, you can short circuit a lot, and your best intentions can backfire. When we look at the two civilizations that materialized after the flood, we see the one rush, rushing on to develop technology, but hurtling toward violence and destruction, and the other approaching things a little slower and a little more thoughtfully, because their primary emphasis, as important as dominion was, their primary emphasis was the glory of, of the glory of God. It's interesting you you make that point too, because I was just reading, uh, I just finished Dan Carlin's book on. Um, the general dread humanity has towards uh, apocalypses mm -hmm. of various kinds. And in the last couple of chapters, he, he was talking about the severe upward technological advancement that we experienced uh, from the early to mid 20th century through to today. And specifically, he he's talking about the development of nuclear technology, nuclear mm -hmm. bombs. And 
it, 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 there's that same kind of thing where it's like, wow, we, we've been making all this super cool technology and we're getting, you know, the, these blast waves are even bigger. We have these deeper craters and there's people on the sidelines who are like, this is not a good thing to be thinking about. And <laughs> it's that same kind of danger of hurtling headlong towards self-destruction where you're, to quote Jeff Goldblum from Jurassic Park, of course, uh, your scientists were so concerned whether or not they could, they never stopped to think whether or not they should. <laughs> yes, indeed. Yeah. And and when um, the prophets show us Messiah's kingdom, it is, to borrow the line of uh, the title of one painting, a peaceable kingdom mm -hmm. where the wolf lies down with the lamb, where uh, nations beat their swords into plowshares. Not because of some external force, not because of some government contrived pattern, but because through slow, thoughtful, prayerful approach to relationships between men, that is to say the gospel, we get to the place where we, we, we can trust our neighbors not to kill us in the middle of the night. We can trust them not to burn down our house or worse, the whole forests surrounding our city because they wanted to have a reveal party and <laughs> we start trusting people to to act mature and to act safely and we find that we don't need the armaments and the weapons of the previous generation but this is predicated upon the success of the gospel of the great commission of people coming to faith in christ and of the outpouring work of the holy spirit in the gospel and every time we see Messiah's kingdom, as it's set forward in, in the prophets, the assumption is e either in plain language, the word of the Lord is going forth from Zion, or we see images of living water pouring out to the ends of the world. But the result is this universal Sabbath of creation that eventually morphs into eternity, the new heavens and the new earth. And, and, and so in the Sabbath, we have this. And if you ask the Jewish scholars, what does the world to come look like? They would say, look at the Sabbath. And, and as Christians, we, we do the same thing. Day of all the days, the best. Emblem of eternal rest. It doesn't mean that eternity will be just church forever and ever. But the, the fellowship and the love and the joy and the, and the, with one another, and most of all with our Lord, that characterize the Lord's day, and, and the freedom and the peace, that's what eternity's like. And if what we're doing on the Lord's Day isn't that, then we are doing something wrong. And we need to not so much set up new rules as go back and check our hearts and our understanding of what it means to meet with God, uh, what it means to have the privilege of meeting with Jesus on the first day of the week. It's no wonder then that people who experience very bad church situations, whether that means the, the worst things like uh, abuse, uh, mm -hmm. emotional manipulation, gaslighting, things like that. Well, I'll, I'll just stick to that example because I can't think of a counter option. But, um, <laughs> you know, when when people do experience things like that, they they lose that hope of what eternity is going to be like. And mm -hmm. it turns them inward and focused on on this life the the outward life as opposed to the inner life and it robs them of hope which is uh, a bit unrelated to the strict topic we're talking about today why church discipline and the standards for elders are such of, of such high importance and and you just opened a door that i'm not going to walk through because that's profound and as, as an elder that reminds me of the tremendous responsibilities laid upon me that's kind of scary because we do have an obligation to make the Lord's Day and the Lord's house a safe place, a happy place. And I'll tell you right now, with quarantine now leading into still more quarantine for all effect. After all six purposes, months. Is the yeah, two weeks to flatten the curve over yet? Yeah, it is it is difficult, especially when we're turned so many directions by competing voices. To bring everybody back together, is that loving? Is it loving to recognize that some people are may le have legitimate concerns about health and others have not so legitimate concerns about health and they've been manipulated. If you say any, if you pick a side here, it's very likely that you will disrupt the peace of the worshiping community. So this is, Satan's made this one really tough. 
God has also made it really tough because he's <laughs> after a better product on the other end, and he's teaching us some hard lessons. We need to remember that. This is, this is not just Satan's thing. God has something bigger in mind here and teaching us the uh, the sanctity of the Sabbath. Again, not in terms of can you play football or not, but in terms of how are you going to treat people? How are you going to love people? How are you going to, to experience joy in your family and in your church and worship on the Lord's Day under such extreme circumstances? And they're not, they're really not extreme. You can think of our brothers and sisters in Red China, in Muslim countries, where even getting together on the Lord's Day can be a life-threatening thing. God asks for so little. He could have asked for all kinds of incredibly complicated things to happen on the Lord's Day. But he didn't come together and hear the word and love one another and rejoice before me. It shouldn't be that hard, but God was gracious in making it that simple. But the the, the overflow, the overflowing resonance is, is an incredibly powerful thing. And it does require of us a lot of thought and, uh, and, and, and requires us to not simply have our knee-jerk reactions out of our own traditions, but to look and see what is God trying to accomplish here? And how can I be part of the solution, not part of the problem? Mm -hmm. There is one more thing I want to mention because I think it's so terribly important. It shows up in the explicitly in the fourth commandment and, and, and later legislation. And that's that the Sabbath day is also for the slave. Mm -hmm. On the Sabbath day, slaves were not to be given work to do. They were free men on the Sabbath day and on the Lord's day. They came together as political equals in that I don't like the word equality in general, but it's the best I can do at the moment. They Everybody came together politic, as politically, legally equal, neither bond nor free in Christ at the foot of the throne. And that this, that this said something about Christianity. Christianity was a religion that moved people, and even Judaism before was a religion that moved people toward freedom. Mm -hmm. At the end of the week, you're supposed to experience freedom. And as slave owners saw this, as they sat next to their, to their slaves, as brothers in Christ, they should have got the idea of, oh, this is what the kingdom of God is like. And that should have carried over into daily life. Well, if that's what the kingdom of God is ultimately like, shouldn't I be working to make it like it now? And Philemon should suddenly become a favorite book of the Bible. And we, I don't know that in our series we'll talk too much about Old Testament slavery, but I think it's worth at least mentioning it here that by the very liturgy that God prescribes for his Old Testament people and continues in some measure in the New Testament, however you want to slice and dice it, there was the assumption that slaves and freemen on the Lord's Day are all freemen mm -hmm. and that they should all be brothers that they should all hear the word of God together. They should sit side by side. There should not be a slave section and a free section, black and white, whatever. There should be segregation in the house of God. In fact, James has some hard things to say about telling people, well, you sit here under my footstool, but you get this really good seat. Mm -hmm. So it's, it is an institution, the, the Lord's Day and Sabbath Day is an institution of freedom. And I wanted to at least put that up there for people to think about before we, before we mm -hmm. stop. Yeah. I remember one, one time, freshman year of college, when I was real stressed out by all the homework I had to do, I am rolling my eyes at myself in retrospect. Mm -hmm. Not that it wasn't actually a lot of work to do, but wow, I was not handling it well. Anyway, I thought to myself, gee, it would just be so nice if I had a whole day set apart just to not do any homework or anything. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, oh... I, I guess God did oh, yeah. kind of invent that idea. Not that I'm not saying it's sinful to do homework on the Sabbath or anything. Again, that's not what we're talking about. But just remembering how I felt in that moment is such a vivid picture to me of what the Sabbath is supposed to be. It's supposed to be a blessing. It's supposed to be a freedom. It's not supposed to be this burden of like, oh, I can't do this on the Sabbath. It's, no, you don't have to. Which also means trusting God to get you to cover your bases as long as you've been faithful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and working hard the other six days. Yeah, and then working hard the other six days yeah. and getting your priorities in order. So again, it structures our labor mm -hmm. uh, with the hope of rest, with the with the intention that we will prepare, we will be ready. And again, what you, what exactly you do is not yeah. what we're talking about. But we're talking about the attitudes 
that are going to play into this. And that's something I've always kind of looked leerily at when it comes to folks in like entrepreneurial mindset groups or uh, places on on Facebook and and stuff. They're like, I get up at 4 a.m. every morning and work three hours straight, no matter what day. I've worked 40 years, 24-7 pretty much, and now I'm a bajillionaire or something. And everyone talks... Every every uh, one I've encountered anyway talks about it in this kind of way where it's like you mm. you never stop hustling no matter what day it is, and that is it's really unhealthy. Toxic, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's basically an impossible standard unless you are the most extroverted uh, workaholic, <laughs> obsessive, <laughs> obsessive, yeah. compulsive person in the universe. And and finally, it shows that there is no trust in god yeah, to provide idolatry. for you and and so your success now is its own idol that you that can you point have to, to make happen too. and yeah. say yeah that's what i did by myself no one helped yes. um and so when when i look at my life going forward and i guess in the past a little bit too i i want to look at it in this way it's like yeah i'm gonna work really hard and I'm going to I'm going to do the hustle but Sunday is not the day for that it is you know maybe there's an email that comes in that I should respond to that's time sensitive or something but it's not the day to be so concerned with yourself and your yeah. your own physical um the only word coming Prosperity. to mind is provenance, but that is yeah. not a word, I don't think. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe prosperity or well-being. Sustenance, but that's the word I was We're back for. to the first fruits of like your your life isn't about you. It's it belongs to God. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And that would right. seem to be a good place to conclude. Yeah, we better stop there because if we <laughs> keep start going again, we're gonna go for a lot longer. <laughs> so we'll stop there. Nice. Thank you guys so much. Do we have any recommendations for this evening? We do. So I actually have two recommendations that are slightly related to one another, uh, at least how I found them. And then I'm actually going to um, affirm against something. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> so uh, my two recommendations are one, there's a wonderful app that I found. As far as I'm aware, it's on both Android and Apple products. At least I would imagine it is, but I have an Android phone, so I know it's on that, called Libby, L-I-B-B-Y. And it's marvelous because if you have a library card in your town, wherever you are, that has a library card system, you basically put in the code on the back of the card into this app, and it gives you access to their digital resources that they have oh, available for neat. rent. And that includes ebooks and audiobooks, which Whoa. leads me to the second thing, which is an audiobook I found on there and listened to in one evening. I believe I've actually recommended it before, most likely. So we'll count it okay. as a half of a recommendation, I guess. Double down on it. Um, and that is Sinclair Ferguson's The Whole Christ, which okay. is a marvelous, marvelous book about um, antinomianism, legalism, and the problem that both of them share, which is looking at your relationship with God in terms of your, your, I guess your justification primarily and then sanctification secondarily in terms of how well you have kept the law. Mm -hmm. And then finally, I am going to affirm against really bad writing and <laughs> specifically really bad analogies. And <laughs> this, do you have an example? I do. Good. Oh boy. Um, let us just say that this is from a a certain uh popular person who touts himself as a writer and a clever user and manipulator of words and we will leave it at that. Whoever knows it <laughs> will will know once I quote it. But here's the quote. <clears throat> the lawn was so green that if green had a word in its semantic family, like red does, that word being vermilion, only that word and no other word would have sufficed. Well, maybe the green equivalent of incarnadine might have sufficed if the light was good. <laughs>
<laughs> okay, I, I knew that might be, but oh. I would think that would be purely intentional on his part. But maybe I'm you wrong about would it think is. so. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Emily, what's yours? Thank oh, you, Brian. Um, let's see. I had one, and then I forgot what it was. Well, I kept rambling. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> Uh, why don't you go, Greg? <laughs> All right. Well, um, I'm not going to recommend a book. I'm going to recommend, I'm going to imitate Brian here and recommend sort of a lifestyle or process. And it's that of listening to remember. Mm -hmm. I, over the last, well, today, last night, and then over a longer period of time, I keep running into former students and, and other Christians who either I've taught or people who share my beliefs have taught who some, somehow seem to have forgotten everything we ever taught them. <laughs> I mean, to the point of embracing ridiculous, progressive Marxist liberal nonsense, as if you could still be a Christian and believe these things. And I'm not talking about minor points of, of, of disagreement. I'm talking about things that would, if consistently believed and traced back to their roots, would reject Christ altogether, and these people seem to do it despite the training they've had, despite the education they've had, despite hearing the word of God in good churches over and over again, they have forgotten. And I remembered of all the times in Proverbs where Solomon says, just in the first several chapters, remember, listen, mm -hmm. write it on the tables of your heart, listen to your dad, law of your mom, put it in your mind, put it in your heart, don't forget, call it to mind. Remember, I wonder why Solomon thought he had to say it so many times. Maybe because when God gives us a tremendous privilege of sitting under the teaching of people who know the Bible and have, making friendships with people who know the Bible, maybe he wants us to take advantage of this. Because when we don't, uh, Satan hangs us out to dry. It's so easy to forget. We, we, oh, I know all that stuff. Yeah, we forget. Why did God say remember the Sabbath? Because we forget it so easy, mm. forget to prepare, forget its consequences, forget to think ahead for what it means. So remembering what you knew. Because for those of you listening, write a note to your pastor, your Bible teacher, or your favorite uh, author of uh, Christian literature and say, thank you for the things you've taught me and I remembered today. Mm. Emily? Well, have I mentioned <laughs> before the show, I'm trying to remember if I've already recommended this, Creature Comforts? I don't think so. Okay, Creature Comforts is an old British claymation TV show. No, you haven't mentioned this. <laughs> okay, it's from the creators of Wallace and Gromit. Uh, oh, helps. already saw oh, yeah. on it. <laughs> All right, well, the premise of the show is they've gone out into the streets and interviewed people. Um, and these are real interviews with just people on the street about different topics. And then what they do is they take the audio and they take it into their studio. And for each person they interviewed, they animate a little animal. <laughs> so it's all these animals talking about <laughs> fun things like uh, what it's like to be in the pet shop and what it's like to go to the zoo or go to the beach or what do they think about science or these things. So it's it's just a fun time. They're they're pretty short. They're all on YouTube. Um, so we'll put a link in the show notes for that. But it's just lighthearted fun so creature okay. comforts again is the name of the show and that's all we have for this evening so thank you guys so much for this conversation it's been delightful thank thanks also to david our producer my lawfully wedded husband thanks to our financial supporters we really appreciate you helping us to keep the show running thank you to our listeners for your continued listening. We appreciate that too. Uh, we'd love to hear from you. If you want to send us an email, you can do that. Our address is haltingtowardszion at gmail.com. You can also like our Facebook page, send us a message there if you want. Um, subscribe to our YouTube channel. Follow me on Goodreads. Brian is also on Goodreads now. And so is David. Greg, what are you going to get on Goodreads? You'll have to tell me how to do that. <laughs> <laughs> All right, someday we'll work on that. All right, thanks so much for listening. See you next week.